Obviously a nice beautiful Saturday out. This guy doesn't need much of an introduction whatsoever. Um, obviously one of the owners of the shop, Pat, and the South Platte Specialist. Um, thank you for your support. We're going to keep doing these Saturday seminars. Love seeing the turnout. Um, if we can help with anything, let us know. And other than that, Mr. Dorsey himself. Thanks, guys, um, gals. I uh, feel blessed to be able to share my passion about the South Platte with everybody in the room. Um, Back in 2005, I, I had the opportunity to kind of put some words down on paper that um, turned into this book right here. And uh, I've been fishing the plat since I've been a young man, and I think it's really shaped me as, a, as an angler and as a person. I think it's one of the most technically challenging rivers in the country. And for me as a young man, I just went fishing, and that's how I learned how to fish. It wasn't that I was fishing for some of the most difficult trout in the world. It wasn't that, you know. It was, you know, Hutchinson has that reputation of that, and um, I just learned how to catch those fish. I learned a lot by not catching those fish, by more by not catching those fish. And I think the valuable lessons that you can walk away from the South Platte are invaluable. So, um, updated my new book here just recently, and um, the common question I get from people is, what's different than the first one? Well, it's a complete revision. All new photos, all new maps, all new patch charts. Added a bunch of chapters. We added one on the South Platte still waters. We added one on the Denver South Platte. So there's a fair amount of new information. So anyway, I hope you enjoy the program. Afterwards, we can we can answer any questions that anybody might have. But we we'll try to take you through the tour um, from the headwaters all the way down um, to the outskirts of Denver. Uh, the South Platte um, commences its story journey high atop the frozen continental divide, which is home to a chain of 13,000 foot um, snow-capped peaks. Uh, the region is comprised of lush valleys, meandering meadow streams, and boulder filled canyons. Okay, click here. Just talked about this. There we go. <laughs> and boulder filled canyons, and, and no doubt has been a fly fishing paradise in its purest form. The cool thing about Cheeseman and other sections of the South Platte is there's a common belief among South Platte regulars that if you can catch fish, in this section of the river, you can probably catch fish anywhere in the world. And I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. As I mentioned, it's one of the most technically challenging fisheries anywhere in the world. Um, you know, anglers like Jay Core and myself and guides that have been working um, the river for many, many years, we just um, hammer home that knowledge leads to success. Um, so the more you know about go. the tactics and the techniques, um, the better angler you're eventually going to become. It's not about a secret fly or a lucky hole. It's much simpler than that. It's really about the knowledge that leads to success. And I think the thing about fly fishers as a general rule, we need to remain open-minded to always learn something. And for me as a guide, that's the most important thing. Is my customer for the particular day walks away with with a nugget or two, and, and there's just so much to learn when you're out there, you know, with regard to the way trout behave, uh, feeding patterns, and so on and so forth. So um, be willing to um, share that information, but be willing to learn every day. I think that's one of the most important parts to being successful. In the book, um, I, I talk a little bit about the hatch overview, and I think um, fly fishing is a general rule. I think fly selection is probably one of the most intimidating parts of our sport. You walk into our fly bins over there, there's 1,600 bins, and where do you start? I think it's really intimidating. And I think one thing for us as fly fishers is we have to maximize our fishing time and minimize our downtime. By that, I mean keep, keep your tangles under control um, and have confidence in the flies. What people do a lot of times if they're not getting a strike is they're constantly changing the flies. And that equates to downtime. So you need to make sure that you have a thorough understanding of the hatches and the bugs, and then have confidence in those that they're going to get the job done for you. So very thorough information in my project here. Obviously, if you're going to come to the South Platte, I have a bit of a problem. I think most of you guys know that. <laughs> You'll need a thorough assortment of nymphs um, and flies and so on and so forth. So let's just go over some of this stuff here. Um, up here on the top, we're talking about midges. Um, obviously, midges are uh, one of the most important food organisms for um, trout in any situation because they're available to fish 365 days a year. The important thing to understand is what midges lack in size, they make up in numbers. So you'll see anywhere from three to five broods of midges hatching per calendar year, which means all of us in here have to imitate the various stages of their life cycle on a nonstop basis. Very, very important. 
We're moving into the blue and olives. Second one down. More of a shoulder season. Hatches. Okay, so we're starting to see that hatch is going to come into focus real soon here. I haven't seen any olives personally yet, but they're coming. We need to see the water temperatures get into that 42 to 43 degree, 44 degree range. Okay, and so that's why we've got that mid-March and May. Typically the high water season is when these start to fizzle out. Okay, you don't hardly see any betas mid-summer. And then again in the fall we see, as you can see, mid-August through November, um, typically one size smaller the fall betas than the spring betas. So that's something that's very, very important. The ones that we'll see here in another week or so are going to be pushing an 18. They're pretty big. Um, then we move into the um, later spring here with the caddis. Uh, keep in mind the caddis hatches really determine on what section of the south pie you're fishing. Are you fishing a freestone? Then they're going to tend to be a little bit closer to the Mother's Day side of things. If you're fishing a deep bottom release tailwater, where the water's cooler and it takes warmer to warm up to get to the 50s, that hatch will be stalled clear into the summer. Okay, so it's important that that caddis hatch can hinge on those water temperatures. Um, then midsummer brings pale morning duns, yellow sallies, golden stone flies, and then the pteranarsis, depending upon where you're at. So the PMDs are going to be a midsummer event, a mid sized mayfly, typically 16s and 18s. They get smaller as the season progresses. Uh, sallies, um, Probably the most prolific stonefly that we see anywhere on the South Platte will be the yellow sally. And then the golden stoneflies, for instance, Cheeseman Canyon and Deckers, a robust population of golden stones. There's a lot of them in there. And then giant stoneflies, about the only place that you're going to see those is going to be on the Waterton Canyon section. Then we're moving into the autumn season here where we got our trichos. We call that the white wing curse. It'll bring the best or worst out of any dry fly fisherman. And then some of these other important food organisms like your scuds, your aquatic worms, your eggs, your crane flies. Um, I can't tell you the fish that we caught on crane flies on my last guide trip two days ago. It was unbelievable. I, I caught a lot of fish on crane flies. Um, and then, of course, think outside the box every now and then with some streamers. And then terrestrials, those are going to provide a little bit more bang for your buck, especially towards the latter part of the summer season. So some of the flies that you have to have. Um, if you're going to visit the South Platte or be successful on the South Platte, and this is difficult, obviously, to narrow this down to just one set of flies, but, you know, as far as midges are concerned, and we know the fact that midges hatch 365 days a year, they're going to be the first hatch every day and the last hatch every day. So that's why we have to come prepared to imitate those. And we're going to be doing a lot of mid-column fishing. Two of my favorites are going to be the Black Beauties and the Top Secret Midges. Those I fish year-round. Like I said, a lot of mid-column fishing. And mid-column fishing is the most difficult because a lot of times people have a tendency to fish below the fish. Does that make sense? They're fishing with too much weight. A lot of times we think about not having enough weight, but when you're fishing to suspended fish, usually a number six is all you need. You just gotta keep it in the right part of the zone. You'll notice there that there's some size ranges. The spring midge, which is coming off now, is a big midge, a size 18. And a lot of people are confusing that big spring midge for a bluing olive. The thing that you'll notice on an olive, he has a sailboat looking wing and the big spring midge wing lays back over his body. That's how you differentiate them. When they're flying, they're kind of hard to, to tell. But most of the people that say they're seeing olives down there right now, they're not seeing many olives. They're seeing the big spring midge. Tony told me he's seeing olives, I believe that. But most of the people, you know, they're not. They're seeing the big spring midge. Trust me, I've been out every day and I have not seen one olive yet. So, um, so those, are, those are important. Um, and then the parachute atoms in a wide range of sizes. Um, but for midges, a 24 or 26 is a great bug, okay? Um, people often ask me, do I tie that? No, I walk over to the bench. I'm not tying a 26 parachute atoms, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Charlie Craven's Juju Betas. This is a must-have. Um, great fly. It's a tough one to tie, but um, it's a good bug in 20s and 22s. Um, Stout Cup Betas. Again, we're talking these are must-have. You cannot fish the South Platte without these two bugs right here. Um, keep in mind, this is tied on a 2X long hook, so a 22 is what I favor most. Um, and then the sparkle done, again, as we start to move into the olive season, which like I said, is just days away. And what happens with the olives is the water temperature is gonna get to about 44 degrees, about 3.30 in the afternoon. That's what we're gonna start to see next week. And we're gonna start to see a few olives come off. And then it's over, quick. And as the water gets warmer earlier in the day, that hatch moves back to the normal sweet spot of 1 to 3 o'clock. Does that make sense? 
So you're going to see a smattering of them in the afternoon, and it moves back, it moves back. We're going to see 70 degrees next week, so we should see olives. Um, buckskin, this was invented by Ed March back in the early 70s. Again, one of my top guide flies. John Barr's graphic caddis. When it comes to fishing pupa, again, having the depth management is critical. That one right there is deadly. I've been known to fish two graphic caddis at a time during the height of a good caddis hatch. Um, and then I'm pretty traditional when it comes to the caddis adults. I typically dead drift them, but I get much better results when I skitter my caddis. Okay, very, very important to understand that. Pat's rubber leg, it's a big one throughout the, the South Platte corridor. Anywhere where there's stonefly nymphs, this pattern right here will produce for you. The yellow stimulator, an oldie but a goodie. It's one of the best yellow sally imitations you'll find anywhere. And it's very good for dry and dropper <coughs> applications. Amy Zant, invented by Jack Dennis. Um, it's probably the go-to bug for golden stoneflies in a size 10. And, uh, you know, the golden stones, depending upon what section of the South Platte, typically it's a late July, early August event and can last for three to four weeks, depending upon um, water temperatures. Scuds. We're going to have a good scud season again. We didn't have one last year because we didn't have any runoff. Uh, Cheeseman Reservoir right now, we're 77% um, full. That's good. It's going to fill quick. We've got 130% pack. So if this thing's going to fill fast, especially if we get another couple low-level good storms like we've recently had. It will fill quick. So May and June are the big scud months in the South Platte corridor. Um, question. Yes, sir. Scuds. Uh, what's, what colors? Uh, Great question. I've got the sizes there, but I, I carry them in um, tan, olive, and orange. I tend to fish more in orange ones. Really? Yes. And um, I tip like a 14 UV scud. That's my go-to scud most of the time. And the orange ones, are they... Normally, the, the bright colors are dead ones as opposed exactly. to, uh, is that what you're imitating with the orange, a dead one, or are they orange in color uh, when they're alive here on the south side? The, the, we're, we're imitating a grammaris scud, which is olive, okay. and they're typically a, a 12 or a 14 when you sing them out of the south flat. They do, when they do die, they turn orange. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about, specifically even in Cheeseman Canyon, we're on the back side of the spawning period as well. So rainbows in Cheeseman Canyon will spawn clear into June. A lot of times they'll take that for an egg pack. Okay? They're just eating that for that reason. So the interesting thing though is like, I've had a scud on my gravel cuff and I sat down and ate lunch and it turned orange right in front of me. So when they die, they turn orange very quick. So that's important to understand too. But um, an olive scud is a good attractor and an orange scud is a good attractor. During the high water season, aquatic worms obviously are important. Pink and red when the water's a little dirty, a little off color. Um, when the water's clear, and I typically fish earthworm brown ones. Um, we fish a lot of egg midge combos in the spring and the fall. Egg midge, egg betas. Great little attractor. Uh, I think the thing that most people do with regard to their egg patterns is they tie them too big. Tie them, you know, a lot of times 16s and 18s. I usually do an 18. Um, that nuke egg's a good one, the hot tail flash egg's a good one. And then we talked a little bit about the beetles, providing a little bit more bang for your buck. So make sure you round off your, your fly selection with a few hoppers, a few beetles, a few ants, and so on and so forth. Um, I'd be happy to email you that slide. Sorry. So, no, 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 because I have that, I have a hatch chart for every single river in there that's very similar to that, and all of those photos came from my book. Um, so yeah, but if, if you would like that, I can send you guys that slide. Just send me an email, I'd be happy to do that. And then, obviously, you want to round your fly selection off with some streamers. Um, streamers are especially ditch, but they certainly have a time and place, and they can be very effective. Again, thinking outside the box. This is one of my favorites here. This is Matt Bennett's Lunch Money. This is a great bug right here. Olive in black. I fished it from Alaska to Patagonia and everywhere in between, and it truly is one of my, my favorites. Did you say lunch? Lunch Money. Money. Oh, money. Not lunch Money. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we were going, we were, I'm going to go ahead and bring all these up here. Stack up. <coughs> yeah, so then some other ones are going to be uh, John Barr's Meat Whistle. Great bug. Um, I'm a very traditional guy. I like woolly burgers. And again, I've caught fish anywhere from Patagonia to Alaska on woolly booger variations. Um, oftentimes I'll use a uh, white woolly booger as my lead fly in a tandem streamer rig and trail a pine squirrel leech behind it. That is my number one go-to for streamers. Um, Autumn Splendor in the 6 to 10, and then 
that pine squirrel leech. Dead drifted, sometimes it's effective, other times it's drift is the, the uh, formula for success. So um, the map thing here, uh, the interesting thing about the South Platte is it's a, it's a massive watershed. When we start to look at the North Fork up here, we start to look at the Middle Fork coming down here and then the South Fork here, it's amazing. 125,000 words in my book to try to explain this and probably still doesn't do it justice. But um, you can see there's several still water impoundments out there, Antero, Spinney, Levama, Cheeseman, Stronsa Springs. And we're going to talk about all of this water right now. I think now um, with the um, state of Colorado booming like it is, which is good in a lot of ways, but for fly anglers, it gets a little bit frustrating at times because some days you feel like you have to bring your own rod. You know? um, and it can be very, very busy. But I've learned how to work around crowds, and I think everybody else gets to can. I think it's important that we all have good etiquette, we share the good holes, and we just treat each other with respect. That's the most important thing when we're out on the water. I see a lot of crazy stuff, and there's nothing out there that's worth getting confrontational about when we're on the river. We're out there to have a good time and relax. But what I've found is if you can go out here and fish Buffalo Peaks and Tomahawk um, State Wildlife Area, there's trade-offs and compromises, but one of the beautiful things is, is you can escape some of the crowd. And that's nice. And out in South Park, you can see here, this is the Mosquito Range right here. And you have this Buffalo Peaks and Tomahawk, which has six miles of river on the middle fork. Okay, there's a lot of access out in this particular section. I took a tremendous amount of time in my new project um, to identify all of the areas that you can park, a lot of the holes and so on and so forth. These, um, I went into every spot and I did, uh, I zoomed in on um, Google Maps, and I got the exact GPS coordinate, put it into a spreadsheet, and gave it to the photographer. So these maps are spot on with the parking facilities and the holes and the names of the holes. So, and, and I tell you, I pulled out my hair. It was brutal, because this all happened during the height of the guide season. That's my wife, man. She was, you know, you're, you're like, <laughs> but anyway, so, the section we're talking about now is up here, okay? So all of those areas have been, and, and all of it, I mean, you can see here, all throughout the book, we have these very, very detailed projects. But this is just a classic meandering meadow stream. This is Tomahawk, you can see the parking facility right there. Um, it's a beautiful stretch of water, and it's your classic riffle run pool tail outs, and your deep, you know, hairpin bends with undercut bands. Now, you're not gonna find a lot of big fish out here, but there's some surprisingly decent fish out here. And you, you work hard for these fish, you execute the right tactics and techniques. There are some nice fish sitting in these undercut banks. There'll be times when you'll catch a six or a seven inch fish on a caddis, and all of a sudden an 18 or a 19 inch fish tries to come and eat it. And when you're just standing there kind of feeling a little bit helpless. And those fish obviously are sitting underneath those undercuts. It's a very, very reliable dry fly fishery. Keep in mind this is a freestone stream. So typically ice out is gonna be middle part of April. Give or take a week or two, depending upon the warm weather trends. It's not a four season fishery like some of the other tailwater sections, so this is gonna be influenced by a heavy water year like this year, and it's also influenced by the monsoon season. So there's times when we get into those wet weather trends, I've seen this particular section of water get up to almost 400 CFS, which is big water. So it can get big, depending upon, but very reliable fishing. So we see midsummer, we see the PMDs, we see the yellow sallies and then we see the caddis. And for the dry fly enthusiast, it's a lovely little place to go around and fish dry flies and or fish dry and drop the rigs. Uh, magnificent view of the mosquito range. And if it looks fishy, it generally is. Um, the tip that I could give you is you always want to fish from the shallow side back into the deeper water, back into those undercuts. Um, rarely do I get into a situation where I'm fishing from the high bank because you have a tendency to scoop more fish. There's times when I do. Next side will probably show me doing that, right? No, but, um, you know, it's a classic dry and dropper river, and just it is, it's beautiful. Fish caddis, fish stimmies. Um, you're going to find fish that are six to twelve inches on average. Occasionally, some bigger ones, but it's just a lovely section of water. Hey, and Pat, then, hey, Pat, sir, when, when did the fish stop moving out of the reservoir? I mean, when did the browns come up? When did the rainbows come up in that little stretch? Well, it's interesting. Um, in that section, can, can I just stall that question for another section and then we'll go into that part? Right. Yeah, it's a great question because it's important because it's a little different than what happens at 11. Right, right. Um, so, um, 
Here's a picture of Landon here with a pretty nice fish um, down in the Badger Basin section, so we're moving down. Um, the interesting thing about this is, look at that first sentence up there. 22 miles of public access on the Middle Fork, the South Fork, and Four Mile Creek. That's a lot of access. Um, again, in addition to that other six miles that's out there. Um, pretty much um, now we're getting down into this Badger Basin section, so we're down. So there's a good bit of access there again um, that doesn't get as much national notoriety and attention as some of these other sections. Looks very similar. I mean, you typically are working upstream in a situation like this. Um, one of my favorite times is to get out there early season like this when the grass hasn't been all trampled down and it's just very, very nice. Um, same strategies, same hatches, same tactics and techniques are going to apply pretty much all throughout this Badger Basin section. As I mentioned, there can be some decent fish in there. This is midsummer right here. Look what flies in his mouth, a pine squirrel leech. I can't tell you how many fish I fool on a pine squirrel leech. That is a deadly fly. Last time George and I were out, we caught fish on a leech. Yes, we North. did. That mm -hmm. is um, one, if you want to think outside the box, that's a good one right there. And it's an easy one to tie. It's a 200R Timco hook, a pine squirrel strip, and just wrap it around the hook. It's just a no-brainer. But some of the bigger fish, no doubt, are residing underneath these undercut banks. So traditional streamer stuff is how those fish get caught, just like this cut bow right here. So again, typically your fish and dries are probably going to be catching a little bit smaller fish, more of the opportunistic fish that are just looking to grab something on top. If you're looking for some bigger fish, try going down deep. I typically use a floating line. There's no need to have a 250 grain or anything like that. Just have a floating line and throw some streamers at those guys. All right, Bart, now we're getting into the section that um, this section, you know, has had a lot of stream restoration, restoration done. We're talking about the Spinney State Mountain Wildlife Area. So now the section that is above Spinney Reservoir, okay? We're still dealing with the Freestone. Now we're the section where the Middle Fork and the South Fork have come together, and it's getting ready to go in. The spawn run that occurs here, like this fish here, typically takes place about one month later than the 11 mile run. So typically the 11 mile run is going to be a mid-February to mid-April event. This typically starts about mid-April. Why is that? Because of the ice. Okay, so keep in mind, this is a freestone. So ice off, then these fish are going to start to move in. Again, a lot of these nice hairpin bends, very similar type of situation. This stretch I found to be a fairly mediocre stretch during the summer months. Um, it just lacks some of that really key structure, although Colorado Parks and Wildlife has come in and done some wood toe and some stuff to try to create. I think the jury's still out on how you know this is going to respond. But um, its main notoriety is going to be these lake run fish that come in from uh, Spinney. Spinney certainly has its own share of challenges right now because the perch, unfortunately, are really taking over that lake. So our trout populations are down. I think the perch are about 60% of what's in Spinney right now, mm -hmm. according to the DOW map that I last looked at. It's a bar graph they did, so it's pretty amazing. But there are some nice opportunities in there. Question uh, on that section. Um, is there any way to find out when ice out on that section besides calling the guide shop? Is, are there any um, uh, websites that'll tell you, okay, ice is still there or not, or it's flowing? Uh, we usually come out in March like we are now here, and <coughs> we were here last March, and it was a lot warmer than this right, March. Right. So is it the best thing is just to call you guys up here and say, is it's the ice off of that? Or? I would look on um, 11 Mile and Spinney State Parks. Obviously this section is, is affiliated with the state park, so those lower lots are closed until um, the reservoir opens. Okay. okay, so you can park out on the road and climb over the gate and walk in. But, you know, if there's a lot of snow, that could be problematic. Yeah. Ice off is going to be late this year. Yeah. Um, there's still 30 inches of ice on 11 yes. mile right yeah. now, yeah. Wow. Um, if you can believe that. Yeah. So um, They're out there with their little tents, their ice fishing. Yeah, yeah. There's snowmobiles and everything out there. Yeah. So I think, I think um, probably 11 mile and Spanish State Parks would probably have that reliable information. And check here because, like, you know, some of our guys run that water fairly regularly. Yeah. Okay. So do you have a question? Well, I think it's kind of just like, you know, is there a location just like we can read the full 
you know, get yeah, flow data to find that data. Yeah. But that yeah. you said just call the state. Park. Yeah, that's the, the yeah. There, 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 there's the, probably not going to be anybody other than Eleven Mile State Park that will be able to identify when the reservoir is going to actually open for the season. And again, that that really varies on how hard of a winter we've had and how brutal of a spring we have. It's amazing how fast that ice comes off when it starts to come off. It goes off quick. Okay. Um, now, a couple other spots that are worth mentioning is the Knight Immler and 63 um, wildlife areas. Um, this is on the south fork um, of the South Platte. So this is getting um, its water off the backside of Weston Pass. Okay. Now that's where the fire was last year. And that fire burned right down to the road. And I'm not sure the ramifications that might result of that, but um, it's a small stream. Um, on average, a very healthy, um, robust population of six to nine inch brown trout and the occasional rainbow. Well, you watch the news and tying renegades. That's what I did this morning. And just, you know, kind of get you kind of fired up. So, I mean, you know, renegades, wolves, limeades, um, just a bunch of attractors, humpies, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, you're going to be targeting a lot of little fish. Great off some compromises, but seeing fewer people. I'll take that fish, take a three weight out there, four weight out there, and have a ball. That's, that's what I think really it's all about. A lot of these classic upstream stuff, great place to uh, wet wade. Again, get out there every season, it's, it's a pretty special place. Um, as we get down to Charlie Myers State Wildlife Area, now we're coming to the first still water impoundment. And so in the project, we actually, I, I wrote about all the still waters. So I did uh, Spinney, Ontario, um, Terry All and 11 Mile. I got the regional experts involved because I'm not a big still water enthusiast myself. I mean, I don't fish them a lot, but I would encourage everybody to partake in that. Patagonia has really changed my view on lake fishing, um, and I'm becoming more of a fan of lake fishing, but there, we have some great still water impoundments here. It's, it's truly amazing. But um, below Spinney, of course, then now we have our first um, tailwater fishery, our first year round fishery. And uh, again, very detailed information. All the holes have been named. Um, I got Landon and Mayer involved on in this to make sure that all the holes were correctly named. And also what we tried to do in this project was try to explain a little bit about the hole and how to fish it and when it fishes best. So just a little bit more than um, just naming the hole, but man, this hole fishes good at 400 CFS, this hole fishes good at 50 CFS, and, and so on and so forth. So. Um, Depending upon who you talk to, there's about six miles of fishable access from um, Spinney Reservoir from Outflow down to 11 miles. It's very reminiscent of a Montana Spring Creek. So you're sitting out here between the Swatch and the Rampart Range. It's, it's a wind tunnel. Let's, let's not kid anybody about that. If you don't like wind, don't go here because it blows a lot of the time. Um, but the spring wind, I think, as a general rule, is the worst of the, of the season. And summer and fall. Um, typically tends to um, tame down a bit. But it all hinges on downstream irrigation demand for the city of Aurora. Classic riffle run pool tail out again with some very nice um, undercut banks. And the state has also gone in here and done some wood tow stuff, um, which is very, very good for the fishermen and a snag nightmare for us. Okay, I'm sure you guys have seen it where they actually uh, take the, the swing bait back, they put logs in like that, they put fabric over it, and then they lay the, the soil back on the top. So we've got these massive undercuts that these fish can hide in. And a lot of that has been done in that middle section now. So uh, robust population of wild or brown trout, probably one of the best brown trout fisheries in the western U.S. Despite the heavy angling pressure and people ripping them off reds and doing all the things that they shouldn't be doing, it still remains to be one of the best brown trout fishes around. This is what we call the humpback brown here. See how the shoulders on that? That's the fish that lives in 11 mile. Those typically come in midsummer, and we see those again in the fall season. We're going to see rainbows, we're going to see cut bows, we're going to see brown trout, and a few snake river cuts. Um, this is going to be the bulk of the fish right here. This is your uh, cut bow. Uh, they're stocked fish. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife stocks the reservoir and uh, with these, and these guys grow very fast. They're very eager to take dry flies, um, very eager to eat nymphs, they'll eat streamers. Um, picture of Spinney Mountain in the back there, named after Ben Spinney, which was one of the first settlers in the area. Um, tried to incorporate some history into the project as well. Uh, picture of Landon Mayer there, 
Uh, my buddy Mark Adams captured that image. That's a nice image. Um, mm -hmm. That's sure. just um, sure. being in the right place at the right time and with a good photographer. And then I was able to come in and get the headshot of that fish. So that was caught on a pooter ball caddis, first week of June. Um, you know, this tells a story. That's what's cool about photography. And I think to me it's one of the most important things. So typically a great, great caddis hatch. So much so that when you're walking across the field, they're buzzing around your head. Okay, so you have to come prepared to imitate those pupa. They eat a lot of pupa. Buckskin is one of my favorites. La Fontaine Sparkle pupa is a good one down there as well. And the Pluto Ball Oil Counter is a good one. Um, the high water season, I think, as a general rule, people shy away from the high water season. Canyon, they're scared of it. A lot of places, they're scared of it. It's my favorite time of year to fish is the high water season. I call it the stupid period. And the reason is I can fish bigger flies, bigger tippet, and the fish aren't nearly as educated with just a little bit of color a little bit more water over the head and so on and so forth. So you can see here, this looks beautiful. This looks like Ireland. This is early season. Uh, we're gonna have a big water season here again, okay? Um, the thing that you wanna do is make sure you wear a long sleeve shirt and bring plenty of off, okay? Because there's a lot of bugs out in the safe field during that high water season. I've seen people come out there with a tank top and uh, that's a mistake. <laughs> make sure you have a buff, make sure you have gloves, a long sleeve shirt. But the high water season, again, Fishing leeches, fishing crane flies, fishing scud, fishing aquatic worms, fishing the big stuff. Fish 4x tippet, our hookup to landing ratio is going to be much better than when we're fishing little tiny bugs. Um, a little bit of color, and there, the bottom line is this right here. Putting that smile on that customer. That's a resident fish right there. Um, if I recall that day with Joe, the flow was about 400 CFS. Again, picture of spinning mountain in the background. We get into that post runoff period. Typically, I consider that like that 180 CFS range and lower. Um, it's a great time, for good dry flies. We're going to see our summer hatches that we just talked about. Good sight nymphing in the transitional zones and the gravel bars. And it's really a lovely um, time of year. Now, this can all be influenced again by torrential rain. I mean, there's times when we'll get those heavy, heavy um, rains out in South Park, so much so that this place flash floods. You guys have seen it. And that's why they put that big ravine out there, is because of the heavy rains that can occur in there. But the summer season is, is lovely. Um, these, in my opinion, are, are one of the sweet jewels that we have in there is the Snake River Cuts. Um, certainly, they represent a small part of the biomass, but there are enough of them there that you'll catch one every now and then. Um, and the brown trout, beautiful fish, midsummer. This pattern right here, that bar merger PMD, um, that's a, that's a must-have. Um, I just did uh, that uh, ask about fly fishing a couple days ago. Um, and a uh, guy asked me if I had one fly to choose for an emerger on the South Platte, what would it be? That's it right there, bar emerger. It's, um, that one, you can't live without it. Uh, standard ones, beadhead ones, and flashback ones for your pale morning guns in a size 16 or a size 18, and you'll be set. So you're getting those really good hatches. Uh, typically fishing is better in the morning on the South Platte. And so that leads me to say, if you have a slow morning, it's probably going to be a difficult afternoon. And the hardest thing on the South Platte is putting a whole day of fishing together. I mean, where you're consistently catching fish all day. You'll typically see the river fizzle out in the afternoon. That's very traditional, especially in places like South Park. So you want to enjoy that morning fishing before these thunderheads come in because you're going to see most of the hatches in the morning. Your, your PMDs are going to be in the morning. Your trichos are going to be in the morning. And in the afternoon, we have very little or intermittent hatches combined with these thunder boomers that often run you out. Uh, one thing that you need to keep an eye on is those because they come in much quicker than you, you think they do. And sometimes you can't see them coming because of the dam. If you have uh, sparks jumping between your cork and your thumb, it's time to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, <it's close> <laughs> you guys think I'm kidding, but it's funny. You'll watch people walking across the hay field and you'll watch them drop their rod. And if it's ever happened to you, you know exactly what just happened to them. They got a little zap on their cork handle. I mean, it happens a lot. So. Keep an eye on those, get back, but there are some really nice fishing um, right up to that, that point right there. And some, 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 some great brown trout in there, um, like I said. So just a lovely little fishery. Um, probably its biggest claim to fame, like the section above spinning, is going to be this migratory stage. Okay, um, It starts sometimes in January, but it's typically in full swing by the middle part of February and extends into April. This is where, like I say, you got to have um, Good manners, you need to assume that these fish are in shallow riffle or spawning, leave those guys alone, try to target the migratory fish. We all know that. Um, 
But um, you know, it's a it's a sweet section, and there are some opportunities to catch some very very large fish during that migratory phase. This is a 14 pound pound fish right here. It was caught on an egg, dropped with a size 22 pheasant tail. But that fish took a size 22 pheasant tail. Look <laughs> you know how big this fish is. <laughs> um, but there are opportunities to catch some very, very lovely fish like that. Um, opportunities to catch some very, very big cutthroats as well. So we've got cut bows, cutthroats, and there are some opportunities to catch some very, very nice rainbows. It's a short but sweet. These fish are moving in to spawn, and they get back out of there because there's a lot of angling pressure. Typically egg midge combos, and then um, I fish a lot of red larvae in there. That's a good tracking pattern. When these fish are seeing hordes of egg patterns, I switch to a red larva. Just a little red beadhead larva, and it's in my book. It's very simple to tie, but very, very effective. We start to see the same thing occur late um, in the season, typically mid to late um, September, and then we start to see the brown trout rolling in. And first, the kokanee are going to come in. This kind of creates a poor man's Alaska, we say. Um, so <laughs> these guys move in. Um, the kokanee were smaller last year, and we're not really certain why. Um, as a general rule, it's been some of the best kokanee fishing and some of the bigger kokanee fishing over the years has occurred in this stretch. But last year they were really small for some reason. Um, they looked like they got teeth like a poodle. Watch out, you know. Some, but those fish are going to move in, um, and then the uh, brown trout are going to follow them in, capitalize on their high protein diet of eggs that they're depositing. Uh, very similar to their cousins in Alaska and British Columbia, they build reds and the fish get behind them. They, they produce an egg tray. Okay? Um, and then, of course, the brown trout are going to move in themselves and begin to prepare spawning once again. So there are some opportunities to catch some quite large brown trout during this time of year, extending clear into um, the latter part of October, sometimes into the first two weeks of November. And again, you can see these fish are very clean during that migratory phase. I believe this fish was only in the river for a few hours. Look at how clean that fish is. And he's come up and over the gauging run and he's come to a lot. Of, this was in the middle lot. So this fish has come up the river three miles. But he's in perfect shape. He's not scratched up. So you know you're dealing with more of a migratory fish here than one that's all beat up. So there's some opportunities um, to catch, you know, fish up to 10 pounds, even bigger this time of year. So we're very fortunate. Uh, Eleven Mile Canyon, moving downstream. Um, I always call this Colorado's year-round playground because it's, I think it's one of the best tailwaters in Colorado. There's actually about eight and a half miles of fishable access here. The interesting thing about this um, is we have a. There's two different maps that represent this. Um, both in the book. Uh, got Greg Blessing involved in this, as I mentioned earlier. Got all of the holes in, in their um, appropriate spots. <coughs> Um, I added a chapter on Happy Meadows, which is down below Lake George, and also a chapter on Wildcat Canyon, which were not in there previously. But again, all the exact locations. One thing that's different here is we have a top release reservoir, which um, has its ramifications during certain times of the year, especially the winter. We're only going to see about a mile of fishable water below the dam during the winter. Okay, And that's because in a lake situation, during the winter, the coldest water is on the surface, correct? And the warmest water is, is coming off the bottom. Typically, it's coming out of the bottom at 39.4 degrees, and it's frozen on the top. And then we flip-flop, we do a spring turnover, and then we have the coldest water comes off the bottom. And that's what makes a tailwater tip. And the warmest water will be on top. But So, pretty reliable fishing in that first mile. Uh, and then again, depending upon the uh, season, you know, we start to get that thing to open up. Um, this year has been really cool, and a lot of the sections were just frozen solid, even at Deckers this year. We had ice all the way up to the town of Deckers this year. It was kind of crazy, but it's a lovely fishery. It's one of those places you can find rice and fish 365 days a year if you really look for them. And you know, if you look in the shaded areas, you look for the bank zippers. Um, this is a great pattern here. This is a high-vis griffin net. I'm going to tie this in my fly tying class this afternoon. But in small sizes, it imitates a small midge, and bigger sizes, a cluster. And this is the time of year when we start to see some clusters. Uh, midges. So um, it's a dry fly paradise. It really is. Um, there is um, easy access, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. Forest Road 96 parallels the river. I think I mentioned there's eight and a half miles of it because where the dam placement is, the bigger part of the canyon. Um, 
So um, there's uh, six or seven campgrounds in there. This is up near Cove Campground. So it tends to get a bit of activity, but in a lot of cases what I do is I'll just walk downstream, um, get into some of those areas. This is down below the tunnels. Some of the areas that are a little bit tougher to get into, a little bit steeper access points. Um, this is down uh, right around the Twin Tunnels in an area called Greg's Office. Um, named after Greg Blessing, but there is certainly some lovely pocket water, a lot of these classic riffle run pool tail outs, and um, it, it certainly um, is a lovely, lovely little fishery. 12 to um, 15 inch fish on average, about 2,300 fish per mile. Um, so it's not a super, super huge biomass of fish, but a very respectable biomass of fish um, in there. Uh, a lot of these Hofer rainbows, because it was hit hard with whirling disease, so they stocked the Hofers. And uh, the good news is, is they're reproducing on their own. They don't have quite the color as some of the other ones, but also a nice population of brown trout in there. Don't overlook the pocket water. I think people have a tendency to overlook pocket water because it's a little bit intimidating. It's a little bit more difficult to wade. Pocket water is one of my favorite stretches because we're targeting less pressured fish. And when they take the fly, they grab it. It's not a little tiny twitch, it's not a little tiny dimple. Great place to throw scuds, great place to throw worms, great place to throw crane flies, and so on and so forth. So some of the bigger fish, in my opinion, sit in that pocket water. Uh, very nice, um, robust population of brown trout, some up to 20 inches in length. This is a picture of Greg Blessing. Um, we cannot guide an 11 mile canyon, so I send all the people that are inquiring about 11 mile to Greg. Um, I think he depicts a western trout guy pretty well, not too. <laughs> He's a crazy man, but he definitely knows the river very, very well. And um, he helped me substantially on Colorado Guide Flies as well as the South Black Project. And I, I appreciate that. Just lovely water, riffle run pool, typical boulder filled canyon that you would expect. Um, and just miles and miles of fabulous fishing. One of my favorite events in there is going to be that Trico Spinner Fall, it, and it's very, very reliable patch. Um, depending upon the year and flows, we can see sporadic trichos last week of June with that hatch intensifying as we go, and we'll see those all the way into October. They're very similar to betas, they're multi brooded, so you're going to see several um, mayflies for an extended period of time. Typically, the duns come off at 7 o'clock in the morning, the males come off the evening before. As a general rule, most people don't get to the river early enough to worry about fiddling around with the trico. <laughs> Okay. You usually will get there in time to get them on the duns. Any conventional upright dun pattern like a sparkle dun will fool these duns. It's like fishing olives, except we just need to go a little bit smaller. Um, this, you can see, you know, the males and the females have different bottom coloration, olive and black and straight black. I've never seen, you know, one of them key on a male or a female. Other people say they do, but I've never seen a fish that wouldn't eat a solid black um, trichler during the height of a spinnerfall. The duns come off around 7, the spinner fall forms around 9, and you have two hours of some exceptionally good dry fly fishing. It's a very, very good dry fly fishing. Long leaders, size 24 dry flies. Um, anytime I can, I take a downstream attack on a trichophito because the first thing they see is the fly. Size 24, 7x tippet, reach men's, downstream attack is always going to be your best bet. Very, very difficult. Um, typically, we see them with a gulping rise form, so they're coming up. They're coming up and they're, they're eating a few of them and they go back down. They come up and eat a few and they go back down. That's how you know for sure that they're keyed in on those trichos. And then one of the most overlooked parts of the hatch is going to be, as that hatch winds down, is going to be fishing drowned trichos. Conventional nymphing rig, two size 24 trichos, size 6 split shot, fishing mid column. I catch more fish after the hatch with my customers with drowned trichos than I do any part of that hatch. It's stupid. Once they get on those, you've probably seen it, Greg and Bart, when you see those fish, they're just sweeping back and forth, just gobbling trichos. It's amazing how selective they can be, but it's very, very important. And then don't rule out some terrestrials like we talked about. Fishing those less targeted areas like this wall here, and there's not a lot of people that are climbing over that, right? Great spot for opportunistic fish to be sitting along there because they're not getting messed with a lot of those areas. It's no surprise that this place here is my favorite place. If I had one place left, one place, uh, one day left to fish, right here. This is where I have only one day left. I'd fish in Cheeseman Canyon. It's, it's been my classroom. 
I fish this on my day off. Um, and you know, people always said you fish on your day off. Absolutely, I fish. I fish all the time, and um, I love fishing. And I tie flies every single day. Um, I can't get enough of it. But you got the the two dams or two maps coming out of here again. Um, it won't take you long if you read this section that um, I spilled my, my guts into this as far as the holes, how to fish them, what flows, and so on and so forth. Um, you have uh, 3.2 miles from the dam down to uh, Highway 126. You can access it from the lake or you can access it from <coughs> the bottom. Um, coming in from the top is a lot of work. How many of you guys have been in and out of the top? Not many. Usually people do it once. Um, <laughs> but it's a lot of work. But I would encourage everybody to do it because it helps you complete the circle. You can see the dam, you can see the lake. Um, but my favorite time of year is when it's spilling. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but it's just, it's a classic boulder filled um, canyon. Um, and uh, it's just a lovely, lovely spot. Um, is it a dam there that's for generation or just a dam? Downstream irrigation demand, purely. Yep. Um, so there's there's a uh, 3.2 miles of access there coming out of the dam. Um, dam was built in 1905. It was named after Walter Scott Cheeseman, who was one of the first influential guys with the Denver Water Department. And um, it's been catch and release since 1972. It's got a self-sustaining population of wild trout, about 5,400 fish per mile. Nowhere, anywhere in the South Platte corridor has the biomass of Cheeseman Canyon. Now, there's days, like I did a guy trip in there this week, you figure there's 15,000 fish in there. Trust me, I didn't find but about 10 of them. <laughs> and that was tough fishing. And so this place, you earn your red stripes in this place right here. It's going to get a little easier coming up. Um, but there are some opportunities um, mm -hmm. to catch some very, very nice fish. Again, we're dealing with wild fish. We're dealing with lovely fish. And opportunities to catch some big fish during certain times of the year. A dear friend of mine, Patrick Folkrod, probably the best guy in the South Holston River back in eastern Tennessee. Um, it's fun to go fish with him and see his river. It's also fun to share with another industry professional like that and to show him, you know, I love fishing the Watauga and the Holston because it's a tailwater. But there are some incredible fish in there. Um, no doubt that these are subspecies of their own. And so after the fire, when, when the populations um, went almost extinct in there, that's why TU and a lot of people did not want to stock this fishery because of these fish right here. And they worked their way through it. It's amazing. I mean, now that the fish are doing great, it's amazing how many rainbows are up in there. The brown trout are in there, too. It's also important to know that these guys here, their peak preference in water temperatures is 42 to 52 degrees, and brown trout is going to be 52 to 62. You don't catch a lot of brown trout as a general rule when the water's cold. They're there. They're just hiding. Okay, they're starting to wake up a little bit, but, um, you know, it's no secret for us that live here that, you know, spring, March and April, two snowiest months of the year. This was May 3rd last year. My guy flew in from North Carolina. I didn't want to go fishing that day because I thought it was going to be too treacherous. He said, Pat, I flew in from North Carolina to fish with you. I said, yes, sir, we're going fishing. <laughs> so we drove down there, and uh, it was a little dicey, but we got in there, and best day of dry fly fishing I've had in years. Uh, these are the type of days that you dream of as a dry fly fisher because it stalls the development of the tons coming off, keeps them on the water longer. They rose for hours that particular day. It froze my butt off and that was pretty darn good fish. So um, this picture is in Fly Fisherman this, magazine, this month. I wrote an article in there on spring strategies for cheesemen. If you get Fly Fisherman, um, there's a lot of good tips in there that can help you with gearing up for this uh, season. Flows uh, were bumped just a couple days ago up to 92, which is good. Um, but it's good, you know, anything under 100 is going to provide really good fishing in there, especially for dry fly enthusiasts. Um, great sight niffing, great olive hatches. Again, those inclement, nasty, overcast days are going to provide the best days. Again, it looks fishy, it traditionally is. This is in the Upper Canyon. Um, I was doing a guide trip with a dear friend of mine, Brian Lean, in October, and uh, we got in back of the truck, and we had a cold beer sitting at the picnic table, and we did the upper canyon, and he goes, he's like, dude, how many miles do you walk in a month? And I said, I don't know, let's pull out my iPhone and check. I did 170 miles in, April, in August last year, just because I have that little iPhone app, and, you know, a little heart, and it keeps track of it. We just sat there, we were adding it up and everything, pretty great. 
No wonder I got plantar fasciitis. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can still see, look at this, Hayman burn. Last year we got four inches of rain in the middle canyon, substantial washouts. When we thought we were done with all of this nonsense that almost happened 20 years ago, how many people have witnessed what's going on in there? Even in the Emerald Pool of Rock in the Lower Canyon, the sedimentation and the stuff that's gone on is crazy. One good high water year, we're going to be in business again. Um, but anyways, that 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 there is amazing. But that fire was in 2002 and still causing us grief today. Mm -hmm. Hard to believe. Um, Pat, do you find the water board has been a little bit more accommodating in terms of flushing some of that stuff out? Absolutely. Last year we were in a drought. I um, Dave Bennett and I have a pretty good relationship, and. Um, I, I sent him an email and I said, Dave, how much water did we get up there? He said, we got a little over four inches of the dam in the rain gauge. And I said, he goes, well, why do you ask? I said, well, because we've had the worst flash flood that I've seen since the fire. He said, can you send me pictures? I said, absolutely. I, I took tons of pictures. It happened on July 5th. Chris Steinbeck was the first guy to see it. Is I, um, I didn't have a trip the next day, but Chris did. He goes, holy cow, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's really good. I'm going to take some bucks. Um, so Dave Bennett, uh, he, he, we were at 50, we were at 100. He brought it up to 400 CFS, which doesn't sound like a lot, but given the state of drought that we were in, Denver Water gave us that water to protect that fish. We made it. The cool thing about this fishery, and the reason that it is so good, is because Dave Bennett, and the Denver Water Board, a large percentage of the year, try to keep the temperature between 50 and 60 degrees. I've got documentation on, on graphs that show that they do that. It's pretty amazing. They actually, Denver Water gets a bad rap a lot of times, but they're actually the good guys. So we have three release points here. Bottom release, jet valve, which is 60 feet below, and full pool, we see this come into place. A lot of times, if the water is very, very cold in the spring, They'll release water out of the jet to warm the water up. Last year, in the middle of the summer, I noticed that the water got warm. And um, so I emailed Dave. I said, man, is, something's going on. I said, the water's really warm. Because I take the temperature every day. And um, I don't know if they thought they were pulling a quick one on me, but they shut the bottom off to do some repairs on it. And man, I, mean, I could tell. I could tell. I could tell when they turned it back on too, because your legs went numb. But um, <laughs> anyway, so they can they can manipulate the water temperature based on this. This is a uh, shot from the caretaker's uh, porch in the water board. So this is a this is a view that you won't get. But when I was doing my book project, 221 feet deep. Obviously, the cold water coming off the bottom there and the spillway, which is really cool. Um, here's the scuds. Here we talk about the scuds. Um, have you ever tried to catch a scud? <laughs> so my son Forrest, um, I had him pick up a rock, I took a fish net in there, and I went and tried to get him, that's what I came up with. But the interesting thing to note here, I did a social media post on this, I came up with a pattern called the UV scud not too long ago. Look at the sheen on those scuds right there, on their, they're a crustacean. But tie them with UVW, they have that natural sheen to them. Okay? So, um, very, very important. The high water season, a lot of scuds. Question. Uh, so on a typical day of guiding, would you come in with your clients on the gill trail? Or are you coming in the upper? And then, question, coming in on the gill trail, do you find that typically you only need to go about midway? Or? It's a great question. You know, different adjustments, you know, as you go up close to the I base I base my location on uh, a couple of things. I try not to fish the same piece of water two days in a row because it won't produce two days in a row. And I mainly produce, I mainly do it off of current conditions. For instance, when the water's low, I tend to fish cattle crossing to Hell's Half Acre more because the stream is much more constricted in those areas and holds 50 CFS better. High water, typically fish the lower canyon more. Um, and if I want to get away from crowds, sometimes I'll go up. And there's really no rhyme or reason. I, I do try to balance my pressure around. If I fish the middle one day, I'll fish the lower the next day, if conditions are suitable for that. Um, so the high water season, all it does is, is it pushes the fish into these soft water margins. Again, big bugs. That's 1,500 CFS. Uh, we're going to see a big water year this year, I'm pretty sure. Something probably pretty similar to that. 
Yeah, and that's a stupid period. Don't shy away from that. That's fun fishing right there. I mean, that's when you can catch some really nice fish. Uh, then we get back into the normal season. You know, we're at 200 to 400 is the sweet spot. 250 in Cheeseman, you can't beat it. Um, lots of these 12 to 17 inch fish, like I talked about, just some of the most incredible fish you've ever seen. Um, flawless fish. They don't have messed up jaws. They don't have, you know, they're just, they're just, it's a, such a pristine fishery. It's, it's truly one of those amazing spots. Obviously, when it's coming over the top, you can wet wave. The only thing you really need to pay attention to is a lot of the ivy up in there. There's a tremendous amount of ivy. I traditionally don't wet wave, but a lot of my friends do. Um, this is two turns from the dam um, up in there. It's a long way. That's eight miles in and out. So that's, you've got to want to be there in that situation. Uh, great trico hatch again. Uh, there's nothing better than a size 24 style cup trico. Bar none. Fish it for guns, fish it for spinners, fish it for ground spinners. Um, one thing too, you know, like, I'm not just trying to get you guys to buy flies, but don't try to buy your trichos in August. That's not, that's not, a lot of times we can't get them in August. You know, you got to think ahead. Start thinking about caddis and PMDs now, tying them and buying them. Don't try to buy your trico because, you know, it's, so, you know, always make sure you, you're always um, staying ahead of the game a little bit. We as fly shop owners have to do the same thing. Like, we're thinking about getting those flies because we can't get them in the middle of the summer. Um, but tie that one up, it's just a buyout body, a little CDC puff. Very, very easy. Uh, and then um, I fished with this guy two days ago, Howard Stranger. This, this will bring um, some of the biggest fish to the top. That's what's cool about Tricos. It brings the wary, the crafty, because it's such a, a big food organism for them um, that that's what you want to um, see, seeing these big guys coming up. Deckers, uh, moving downstream. Um, pretty much all the same tactics and techniques apply there. Uh, two maps to represent this. Again, uh, detailed information once again all throughout parking um, and everything in there. Uh, pretty much all the same strategies apply. I do fish deckers a lot um, during the winter, November to March. That's my fishing. And deckers is fishing a lot better now than Cheeseman. And the thing about Cheeseman is Cheeseman has too much structure. It has too many boulders, too many deep holes, too many spots the fish can hide. And that's what they're doing now. They're hiding. But once the water warms a bit, once we start to get consistent beta hatches, you're going to go, where did all these fish come from? They're there. They're just hiding. Deckers has a lot more friendly structure. Um, a lot more riffle run pull tail lines. And some very nice fish. Uh, about, I think, 2,700 fish per mile is the latest electroshocking data there. So certainly not as many fish. But um, we started getting um, young of the year again. It's taken a long time. It took almost 18 years after the fire before we actually started to see uh, recruitment in this particular section again with rainbows. Round trout population is coming on strong, but um, we're seeing we're catching some really good rainbows right now um, down there. But it's not uncommon to catch um, rainbows, you know, up to 18 to 20 inches. Like I said all the same strategies apply, all the same hatches apply. Um, the only difference that you have is you have some tributaries that enter the system. 92 coming out of the dam right now, 114 at Deckers because of those additional trips that, that enter the water right there. So, um, and I said it's a great, it's a great winter fishery. Um, it, it, you know, adjust your expectations, and um, you can go out and have a pretty solid day in the winter. Pretty much just have to target those soft water margins. Stay away from the fast stuff. Fish sure in the in the frog water. Um, you don't want to be fishing these heavy tongues of current here. You want to be back in here. Predominantly midges. We talked a little bit about that spring midge. That midge is a size 18, which means you've got to upsize your pupa imitations. Yeah, that's real important there. Uh, Determine on which one they're keying off. Um, and that, that, that spring midge is, is really fantastic, and they really drive hard in the riffles on that midge. So typically, like a size 18 Black Beauty, size 18 Manhattan midge, size 18 um, Top Secret, very, very good. And then, like a size 18 Matt's midge, is good for the adult. Okay. Um, it's back in uh, a Lone Rock campground there. Bart, Greg, yeah. they ought to name this your hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, again, <laughs> special time of year. <laughs> call in sick. If you're going to call in sick, that's when you call in sick. If you're going <laughs> to get the brave dry fire. <laughs> Picture of Dr. Miller. This is 
quote fish was full on sparkle dud, on a, uh, a size 22 sparkle dud, not 20 actually, on a three weight. That's pretty cool. That's a big fish to get on a dry fly with a three weight. That's, that's Fred's deal. He always brings his three weight. It's not a bad deal you know, this time of year to have two rods rigged, one with a nymph rig, one with a dry fly. Because you know how that works. You see one rise, you, tie, you cut your nymph rig on, you tie a dry, and he quits. Um, picture my son Forrest. Uh, the kid ties more flies than I do. Um, he uh, kind of followed me in, in the fishing career, which was really exciting for me to see. Um, fishing up in Mon Rock. Uh, brown trout populations are quite a bit better down in the Deckers area. Um, obviously, as we move further away from the dam during the summer season, the water gets warmer. So we see that 52 to 62 quite frequently. So we have better growth rates, more activity, better hatches as a general rule. There's some amazing brown trout in Deckers. I mean, there's brown trout over 20 inches in Deckers. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I caught a 23 inch brown at Deckers last year. So there's some, there's some big fish. Uh, again, the pocket water here at Highway 126. Um, this is the Rock Garden, one of my favorite stretches. The fall season, magical down there. Just a lovely, lovely section. Waterton Canyon. This is the one that uh, I cut my teeth on as a young man. My father um, took me fishing a lot, but it wasn't enough. Imagine that. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough that I could, um, once I got my driver's license, I could go fishing on my own. Um, I could ride my bike up into Waterton Canyon and I could fish. I, I typically was fishing two days a week. Um, both my parents were school teachers. And that, that was hard in its own way. But my dad, he said, if you put as much effort in your schoolwork as you do your fishing, you'd be a straight-A student. And um, <laughs> I did fish a lot. I tied a lot. And, uh, but Waterton was special for me. You know, the dam was built in 1984, Stronta Springs, um, up here. Uh, there's six and a half miles down to, you know, where the old Castler water treatment plant is there. Um, so this is a great little fishery. Um, picture of my lovely bride here. And, you know, when you get up, in the canyon, um, it's it's hard to believe that you're just outside the outskirts of Denver, up in here. How many guys fish water to Fair amount. Nice. <laughs> you know, it's um it's an interesting fishery, and we'll talk more about the flow fluctuations. But it's a lovely fishery. Um, best way, in my opinion, to access this is going to be going up on a mountain bike, like I said, six miles up to the dam here. And um, this is Strontia Springs. This is. Uh, 7,800 acre feet still water impoundment. Smallest still water impoundment that Denver Water has, but it's the most important one that they have because this is where the day-to-day -day changes to bring water into the city occur. So what that means is it's small, but it changes a lot. And so um, it's, it's going to be a lot of flow fluctuations in there. So you have to be prepared for that um, almost every day. This is a biggie here. Typically in the summer, I, I rarely not see a rattlesnake in there. And so what you need to do is make sure you're watching yourself when you're stepping over rocks, logs. Just keep your wits about you because there's plenty of them in there. You'll hear them, you'll see them. Um, you'll see them on the trail warming up and stuff. Um, so just keep an eye on them. And there's a lot of um, sheep and stuff in there. Uh, I'm always just dumbfounded when I'm watching somebody over there taking a selfie with a sheep. You know, it's like... <laughs> These guys, these guys are nothing to, to mess around with. No dogs are allowed in the canyon. Don't feed the sheep, obvious reasons. Um, you know, and uh, this is some footage my neighbor took oh, right here. Wow. Um, this is pretty cool right here. Yeah, this is cool. So, yeah. So there's there's some opportunities to see some some really cool things in Waterton. I would encourage you to take your camera. Um, the lower section in Waterton is more of a put and take fishery. So Colorado Parks is. Wildlife stocks the 8 to 12 inch fish. Um, standard regulations apply there, but I would encourage everybody to go up top. This is Mill Gulch. Um, so this is up above Marston Version, and um, it's uh, above the bridge there. This next thing is going to blow you away. So, it, like in all sections, I, I got Jeff Spone, who's the former biologist, he's been promoted. Um, Tyler Suar is the new biologist, but I got all the electroshocking data. 4,300 fish per mile in Waterton Canyon. That's almost as impressive as cheese meat. The thing is, though, there's not many fish over 11 inches. 
Okay, so most of the fish are between six and 11 inches. Um, and there's a lot of fish. Um, it's interesting because I hear probably more people complaining about this fishery um, not catching fish than any section of the South Platte. Yet, it has the second highest biomass of any section in the South Platte. Okay? And I think it's probably challenging because the flows are adjusted a lot. It's a difficult fishery when it's high. Um, but it's a great fishery. Picture my wife with a very representative fish in there. And it's good stonefly water. So a Pat's rubber leg, drop a blue beadhead pheasant tail, PMD nymph, an RS2, that kind of stuff. This is right out our back door. I can be here in 25 minutes from my house. Grab the bike right up in there. Um, and it's, it's just awesome stonefly water. Like I said, it's just a lot of these deep, fast, oxygenated pools that stoneflies just thrive in. When you sing that water, it's amazing the stones that are in there. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So it doesn't really matter what time of year because there's always several classes of stoneflies in the river all the time. When I first started fishing waters, and we were fishing woven body stoneflies, you know, all winter long and catching a lot of fish on them. But again, you can't go in here without a fast rubber leg. Again, very representative. These are lovely fish. But they're not big fish. But, you know, who needs big fish? You're going to see joggers, you're going to see walkers, you're going to see fishermen. Um, but it's, it's a nice little fishery. And you'll see some of them eating dry flies. You'll see a lot of them eating nymphs. And so, gosh, I mean, to me, it's not all about big fish, it's about the experience and having a good time. And here's one that I think is right in our backyard that's probably one of the most underutilized stretches of the South Platte River. Yeah, do you think that's because, uh, <clears throat> I've only been in Colorado 10 years, but my brother's a firefighter here, and you know, it was closed for all that amount of time. Do you think that maybe is what's, I'm not disappointed to not see a lot of guys up there. Right, right. Uh, do you think that's part of the reason, just it was closed for a while, and it was a human fire? Or yeah. I think, you know, um, I don't know how many people had the opportunity to fish it right after Strontia was built. You know, it was closed for a while and then it opened up. There was lots of 16, 18 inch fish in there when that thing opened back up. So I'm talking back in like mid 80s to late 80s. That's where I fished all the time. It was one of the most incredible. I fished there more than I did at Dacker's because the fishing was that good. Um, plus there was a healthy um, population of ground trout. Then, then we had the Buffalo Creek fire which created a lot of sedimentation, a lot of insect choking sediments, goofed up the bug life, and so on and so forth. So just like all rivers, they have their cycles. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people got discouraged with that downfall, and, and I just don't think people have really given it a chance. But um, the electroshocking data doesn't lie, you know. And, and the thing about Jeff is he's been so helpful to me to provide all of that stuff for all of us to benefit it, you know. Um, but I think, you know, again, uh, it's a moody river because of the flow fluctuations. Um, you know, that can be tough. Uh, you know, we all know that when they change the, the flows, that kind of fouls fishing up a little bit. So it's a little bit tougher than some, but it, it, certainly, um, it certainly has its, its biomass. In there, which is really good. We're going to close up with the North Fork of the South Platte. Um, it's another option, of course. Uh, probably the biggest disadvantage to it is the amount of... Um, or lack of public water. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with um, the water that's coming off the backside of Kenosha Pass here. Um, you got Geneva Creek, which is one of the big tributaries there during runoff. Um, and then you have a little bit of sporadic access between Shawnee and Bailey, but there's four leases that we got on um, in there, private leases. You have two and a half miles of access um, to Jefferson County open space above Pine, which is a decent little stretch of water. Um, and then, you know, from down here where the old South Platte Hotel is, um, you have some sprinkled water, you know, above on the South Fork and the North Fork in there. And then, you know, what's really disappointing is you don't see a huge spawn run that comes out of Strontia Springs for some reason. At least I've never, and the people that I've talked to, you don't see a run like we see out of 11 Mile. And I don't know why. Because I know it's a decent still water impoundment. I know there's plenty of fish in there, but we don't see that. Maybe they just come up. Whoop, I'm, talk, I'm looking at the wrong one. Here's Strontz right here. Um, right in here. So um, it's hard to say. There is a decent one that comes out of Chatfield right around um, St. Patrick's Day. Talk to Carrie about that. It's pretty amazing. Some nice rainbows that run up in there. Okay, so, um, so this is very dependent upon the Roberts Tunnel, which Denver Water decided they were going to shut off about four or five days ago. 
So now the natural flow is down to 15 CFS, which is a real bummer. Um, and what happens then is the stressed fish, um, you know, we get stressed fish because of all the heavy mine tailings that are coming out of Geneva Creek. So a lot of times we lose these fish, um, a large percentage of the fish because of that. So uh, when the water is supplemented, it can be a great fishing. Like right now, um, the good news is it's going to get hot next week and we should start to get the start of runoff. It's going to add some water and it should protect those fish. Um, but it's a nice fishery um, in the winter. It, it uh, adds, um, acts like a tailwater because it's the water coming out of Dillon Reservoir. So they're bringing water from one side of the Continental Divide into this section right here. Uh, this is really more of a water conduit. This is how Denver Water Board brings water from Dillon to this side of the Front Range. They don't bring water to this side of the front range unless there is a downstream irrigation demand. It's in conjunction with the Blue River Decree. So the reason they shut it off is because there's no need for water on the front range right now. We've got ample water. And so um, it's a goofy way of looking at things, but Denver Water Board, um, if they release water, they're actually violating. They're get going against the law. Okay, so that's, that's where we're at here. Um, so you know, it's when you have a friend that works for it that's honest with you, and you know, you know, it, it's interesting to, to get some feedback on that. But um, this section, you know, has a lot of different game fish, a lot of nice big fat rainbows. Um, it's a little bit more fabricated than many of the other sections, obviously. And we're dealing with a, a strong stocked fish population. Uh, you can see a lot of times when Denver water moves water, like this here, we will see flows of like up around 600 CFS. So it's difficult fishing a large percentage of the year. See the feaster famine, it's a lot like the blue. Pretty sterile aquatic life. Um, you see occasional caddis, occasional squala, which is one of the few places in the South Platte that has squalas. It does have a robust population of winter stoneflies. So I always encourage people to tie a size 18 black pheasant tail for that. Um, so you'll see those crawling around. Um, and the mayflies there are going to be your drakes and your red quills. Uh, obviously, very a lot of midges and bigger knots and trichos. Uh, tigers, we see brookies, we see cuts, we see cut bows, we see rainbows. Uh, the full gamut in here, and we teach a lot of our winter classes. We do a lot of our corporate stuff in here, and uh, the palominos are always one of the highlights in this particular section. So, uh, it's not that you can't fish this. All you have to do is book a day, and we take people in there on what we have a limited access program. So they'll let like eight, up to eight rods per day in this particular section of water. So um, I think in the fall, like most other sections of the South Platte, what happens is we see the downstream demand for water shrinks because the crops are done, people aren't watering the grass, and so on and so forth. So then the flows tend to be a little bit more stable, and we're not having that with big, big flushes of water. <coughs> That's when the fishing is going to be best. That's when the dry fly fishing is better. That's when the nymphs are better, and so on and so forth. So, um, that late fall can be a pretty nice time of year. Um, it's a great streamer fishing. Um, I always encourage people to be well rounded with their approach. You know, fish nymphs when you need to fish nymphs, fish dries when the fish are rising. Um, if it's slow, think outside the box from time to time. One of my favorite rigs here that we talked about early on was that white woolly bugger with the pine squirrel leech. I can't tell you how many times it saved my day on this river when the fishing was just off and, and streamers were really good. Um, fall is magical in there, like I said. Um, brook trout like that, it's all colored up, eating streamers, um, even up in some of those uh, pot flows in preparation of spawning. And there's opportunities to catch some big fish as well. Um, we'll see fish upwards of 30 inches from time to time. But the bulk of them are going to be these rainbows in that 14 to 18 inch class. Uh, we fish a lot of egg midge combos, just a lot of big attractor type stuff. Um, because these fish, more times than not, are feeding opportunistically because there's not the heavy hatches that we see in other sections of the river. So I've tried to take a stab at um, this whole South Platte corridor. It's pretty amazing. I would encourage everybody to. Um, Try to fish as much of it as you can. It's, it's truly, we're so blessed here with the opportunities that um, exist from the headwaters and you just see how beautiful those potentillas are and uh, just great opportunities out there in South Park for some small stream fishing and um, all the way back to Waterton Canyon in 
everything in between, you know, legendary uh, tailwaters that exist um, in here. So it, it's just, I think, there's something for everybody on the South Platte, and I think it's just, it's really up to you to get out and, and to force yourself to go to new places. Um, even new sections of the river, I think we're all creatures of habit, and we tend to go to the same hole based on previous success, and really we don't push ourselves sometimes to go into to new locations. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Um, I can't say enough about it. It's, it's um, one of my favorite places in the whole world of fish, and I try to bounce around, um, try to take as many photographs as I can. I, I love photography. Um, I, I get as much satisfaction out of nailing a shot like that as I do fishing. It's, it's really fun to surround yourself with passionate anglers, but also passionate photographers. And like I said, down at Deckers, that fish came out of Ray's Run. That's a big round trout. They're mm -hmm. down there. I took the bats right away in the high water season. Um, so, anyways, I hope you enjoyed the mm -hmm. photography. Um, and everything that kind of came along with it, and uh, certainly we can answer questions now. If you enjoyed my photography, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And I try to um, provide some valuable content that um, I'm hoping that will help you elevate your game to the next level, um, as well as just kind of enjoy some photography. Um, we've got a stack of books there. I'd be happy to sign them or personalize them or whatever you guys want. But more importantly, I want to be able to help you guys if there's any way that I can. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I've been guiding now for almost 30 years, and I still love it as much as I did when I started. And you know, I get to fish through my customer, and it's really a, it's been rewarding. It's been a fun ride. So um, if I can help in any way, just please don't hesitate.